Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on the Conscious Resistance Network and the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel. So today we have uh, Jamie Sherman, who's a, um, an anarchist and a founder of the Voluntarist uh, comic book series. Uh, really awesome uh, uh, comic book series regarding uh, just talking about voluntarism against the state and, uh, you know, um, cool things like that. <laughs> first Absolutely. One, the, the first one I've seen, is, it seems like you guys are unique in your, in your field, right? Oh, yeah. I, there's no, as far as I've seen, I mean, I've done a bit of searching, but I've never seen anybody who's put libertarianism at the forefront of, um, you know, a comic universe. Yeah. I, it just hasn't been done. Sure, other comics have kind of had it underlying, you know, you think of Alan Moore and, and Watchmen and, and V Fedetta, you know, he's a philosophical anarchist. Yeah. Um, but there's nothing out there that really s assumes that to be the premise, assumes the principles of liberty as the norm that the you know reader is supposed to connect with. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to mention the Watchmen. That's that's one thing that my brother really loves. Um, yeah. yeah, that 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 was a, a comic book series, right? Before it was a, a movie, right? Yeah, gra you can, yeah, considered like a graphic novel. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, my brother's big time into that stuff. So he, when when I told him about your, I showed him your website. He's like, "Wow, it's awesome." <laughs> so, That's awesome. I was liberty too. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm I'm uh, slowly introducing him to the concepts. Uh, you know, he's got oh. he's got a lot of the same questions. You know, you know, how would how would this happen? How would that happen? Sure. Right? So it takes a lot of yeah. explanation. You know, got to break down the uh, status barriers in your mind, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so tell me about you. How did you become an anarchist? Like, you know, your background. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's something that happened over time. I think kind of like most people, unless you're born feeling that way, I think a lot of people take time during their lives to start to think about things. And usually something sets that off. For me, what set me off um, was my American government history class uh, in college where I was discussing and learning about the American eugenics movement. And I hadn't learned about that before. And it made me think, okay, what else haven't I learned uh, about American history? And that caused me to start to spend a couple of years researching and looking back in time and kind of kind of re-approaching everything I believed. Um, and I think that led from one thing to another. First, you know, starting to see the state as being a real problem and an evil and uh, starting to go down the path of libertarianism and then eventually working into the philosophy of things and, and you know, coming to my ethical maxims, um, you know, and reading some stuff with, you know, Lysander Spooner and Mark Stevens and thinking about, you know, should goods and services of any sort be provided at the barrel of a gun, I, I kind of had to just take that little bit of leap, leap of intellectual faith and just say, well, if I'm going to be logically consistent, you know, I, you know, I'm not at the consequences yet. I'm not thinking about the how or the why, but if I'm going to be logically consistent, I have to admit, okay, at a base level, if I believe in consent and I believe in true liberty, that has to go all the way to the individual and, you know, and then after that, you kind of have to figure out, well, what's next? And so that kind of took place in my mind about over the course of three years. Three years. Oh, yeah, that's, about, uh, that's what they say, right? With the um, transition from a minarchist to an anarchist, right? Anarchist. Yeah. <laughs> so something anarchist like to anarchist goes a lot quicker than the first, you know, going from loving the state or thinking the state's, you know, okay for certain things to, you know, okay, maybe the state is actually overall bad and there isn't really... A good part of it, and a lot of people go with the "oh, it's a necessary evil" thing, and that kind of bent of of, of mind. But mm -hmm. necessary evil, right? Yeah, yeah you, you have to pick right. one. You have to pick one, right? <laughs> yeah, because the political parties. And yeah, so on. yeah. Actually, what what you said before about um, that, you know, in it, you it started in your history class. So I assume you went through, you know, high school, right? The regular um, government school that we all went through. Right. I, d I didn't actually. I went through all private schools before ah, okay. to my uh, undergrad institution, which was public, as well as my graduate institution. So, 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 how many years was it public or uh, private? You said uh, everything from first through twelfth grade was all in private schools, wow. different various private schools. Cool. All right. So then, then you do, you do, you don't have so much of a state slant as most people do right i guess certainly yeah not necessarily a worshipfulness of the state or feeling like what else is out there obviously i had that concept and that came you know that was a bit of conservatism you could say what you know before that i would have considered myself probably a mainline republican um and and in practice maybe more of a neocon um but when it came to the economic side, I understood liberty. I always have been an entrepreneur, naturally, you know, selling lemonade or candies on the corner as a kid and do whatever you could to make money. And so to me, I always intimately understood the concept of free marketism as far as being able to see this is what happens when you stop somebody from doing that. I mean, 
funny story. I don't know if I've ever told this before, but um, on a, in an interview, but when I was a kid, I was in uh, middle school, and I got in trouble with the school for selling smoke balls in school. I found out that I could go across to the CVS, buy smoke balls for two fifty, and sell them for five dollars at school. And so I started oh, selling them. <laughs> yeah. By the end of the week, I made like eighty bucks, and then I got in trouble. Um, but <laughs> fortunately, you know, it's back then, especially, it wasn't as bad of a thing. And in being a private school, of course, you know, there's not police involvement. Now, today, you look at public schools, you look at what's going on. I mean, in the no, the no tolerance for anything schools, it's scary. Um, I could have definitely been in much bigger trouble had my life ruined in some ways because of that. And, uh, you know, it's scary to think how much school prevents entrepreneurial thinking, um, especially if you're in public school. But, you know, any kind of school, like, they, they really don't want you to use that as an opportunity for the marketplace. So... Did, did you hear about the uh, the recent um, article about this these kids in um, in uh, Great Britain that this, this one kid he made like fifteen thousand pounds? Did you hear about that? <laughs> was he the one who was bringing candy to school? Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. yeah I, <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's that's someone right after my own heart, exactly. Uh, yeah, and and uh, he was making so much money, he had to employ another kid, <laughs> and, right. and he was having a great. Uh, you know, little business going on, and of course they had to, you know, shut him down, send him to detention, say, you know, don't be starting your own business. That's not, <laughs> that's not what we're teaching here. <laughs> it's it's downright terrifying. And the funny part is, is it's so natural for entrepreneurs to be there because you're like, I'm in this forced environment. I'm around my peers. I tend to know what they like because I'm one of them, right? And it's just natural if you're an entrepreneur and you're that age, you're like, hey, you know, my friends would probably like this, or I would like this. You know, I bet you they'd like it too. And they stifle it. They, you know, they, they try to prevent anybody from selling anything that's not school approved or for some school fundraiser. And uh, it's absolutely terrible, Ter- yeah. terrifying, terrible, terrible. Sorry, just combine those two words. Two <laughs> words now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that's the um, you know that's the idea of being an entrepreneur, right? You see, you see a niche or you see a demand that's not right. being fulfilled, and then you you move to you fill it, and you know, right? Lo and behold, you have a successful business, right? That's the that's the epitome of a successful business model, right? So, right, finding needs and filling, fulfilling people's wants. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, basic economics. Yeah. So, so tell me how um, you know how you got inspired to to start your your volunteerist comic book. Sure. So I've always been involved with uh, you know comic fandom and cosplay at some level throughout my whole life. You know, I've always been nerdy in that way. Played Star Wars, role playing games, stuff like that. <laughs> um, but when I was uh, in undergrad a bit, and then leading to law school. I started to think about how liberty and my interests would intersect. And I started off with creating these, you know, kind of like real life superhero characters um, that would dress up and I'd dress up in this costume and like go and hold up signs to wake people up to liberty. But then down the road, I thought, okay, how do I take this to the next level? How do I make this something that is, you know, a culture medium? Um, And it was my, uh, you know, basically the summer, I guess you could say, when I was studying for my bar exam, um, I decided that I wanted to create some sort of you know movie or film because I had a background in that and so I started do some flushing out of details doing some background writing I realized by the end of it man to make this quality kind of production it's going to take too much money so I said okay well what could I do that I could reasonably do with a quality outcome and comics was the next thing I was like oh that makes sense and so I started to finish up the background story and adjust it for you know a comic kind of uh, portrayal and just ran with it from there on out I just said okay friends and family let's see what we can raise and I just kept going with it wow <clears throat> Very nice. So, so you you like uh, draw all the all the the the, fig- the figures, the comics, and everything, and you, and you do the, the plot yourself. No, I just I don't do the primary what's called pencils and inking. I work with other artists who do that. I my forte is more in graphic design and the background story writing, web design stuff like that. So what I do is I'll create storyboards, write the backstory, do sketches of figures, and work with other artists. And so, yeah, you know, there'll be points where I'm involved with that work. You know, if we're working back and forth, you know, I know how to use Photoshop well and Illustrator, so I can sit there, adjust things, move things, change colors, which I have, you know, for different issues if I want to get something a little bit different or add a little something. Mm-hmm. You know, so I do a lot of tweaking or, or sometimes lettering, you know, doing that type of mock-up. Um, but, no, I work with other people because with every stage, and this is typical in the comic creation process, you usually have someone who does all those things separately. You usually have someone who's doing pencils, someone else is doing inks, someone else is doing flats for colors, then the actual coloring, then someone else is doing lettering. And usually it's a several-person process. Um, it's pretty rare that you can have somebody who can do it all at once uh, without floundering in some little bit of an area. You know, it's, it, People tend to have niche skills on that, and the best way to get somebody... Uh, or the best way to get a quality production is to get somebody for each stage who uh, is talented at that. Yeah, definitely, 
division of labor, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. It, it, and that's how it works in comic books or oh. creating figures and stuff like that, whatever yeah. it is. So. so, so how like are you able to pay these people, or is it just mm -hmm. uh, like a hobby, or for now, or has how, how far have you come right now? Oh yeah, all of it's paid. You know, initially I put in some of my own you know, seed money to get it going, and then got people to fundraise through the Indiegogo campaigns. Same thing happens in each one. Usually, what happens is I put down a little bit of money to get something produced, so people see the direction, and then other people see the direction that I'm going, and they're like, "Oh, okay, this is gonna be cool," and then they you know continue to fund it. So that's usually how it works. You know, I help create the campaigns, create some of the base imagery, work with artists to that, put a little bit of money that way. Then I have to in a show, and then people say, oh, I see where you're going, and they get on board more readily because, you know, that foundation's been laid. Um, so, yeah, you know, every, everybody who is uh, works in the comic, I don't, I don't do, you know, stuff for... Uh, nobody's ever done anything for the comic that has been unpaid as far as, you know, any artwork or anything like that. There's always... And that's really what you have to... If you want quality work, you have to... <laughs> you have to pay people. It's, it's easier now than that, more than ever because of the internet, and there's so many ways you can hire artists through different channels. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want quality and you want professionalism... Definitely need to be able to pay your artists. It's yeah, important. yeah, it looks like high quality stuff, and you know, it really looks good. So, so you have, um, so you have the the second issue is about the TSA, right? And um, this is yeah, this is technically the third full um, production for an issue. So this would be the third issue in print. Okay. Um, the second one that was fully completed was Voluntarius versus State of Zombies, okay. and the first one is called issue number one, and now it's called issue number number one special edition because it's a compilation of like the first. Um, and the second fundraisers in those materials. Um, but the one with the TSA, yeah, it, it's Voluntarius versus the TSA, so kicking TSA butt. I tried to launch it at a time when everybody's thinking about flying. <laughs> Holidays, right? Every, really? Oh, I see. <laughs> right, exactly. People are thinking about going to see family over, you know, whatever it was, from Thanksgiving to Hanukkah to Christmas to whatever, you know, <laughs> New Year's. Everybody's flying. People are starting to think about travel. So I wanted to have it kind of be a little bit relevant so people, you know, remembering, oh, man, the TSA is killing us, you know, one hour at a time um, or, or, you know, trying to grab our junk. Yeah. So, you know, it's it, it's something that I've always wanted to do something on. And I actually, um, in my, my grad thesis, I did a paper on the TSA and why they should be dismantled. So, Oh, really? Oh, okay. So you, <laughs> so you wrote a good, all right, awesome. So yeah, I wrote a legal thesis on it. <laughs> awesome. Oh, so wait, so you were studying, you were studying law, or, or I was. Yeah, I, I graduated with a law degree, and I'm a licensed lawyer, attorney. Um, but I don't usually use it for practicing for others. I kind of hate the court system, obviously. Yeah. So I like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I like legal academia. I like informing people of their rights and helping people think through those issues. But personally, I hate kissing the butts of judges and dealing with annoying prosecutors and so on and so forth, you know, so I, I try to use the, the legal knowledge for helping people protect themselves and for um, just keeping up to date with the academic side of things. So, so what do you do? Uh, I assume this is not your primary income. The, it's a comic no. Yeah, this yeah. is literally, yeah. I literally, I know it surprises some people, but I'm like, yeah, this is just a hobby. Like this is something I do in my in my little bit of spare time. Yeah. Um, but I, I do put my heart and soul into it. It's just you know, I wish it was my full time. I, hey, who knows? Maybe one day it will be. Yeah. Um, but no, I just see it with love because it's a project of love. But no, the main thing I do um, you know, to bring in the money is I teach and tutor. So I teach multitude of classes, everything from a Cambridge. Uh, international program to uh, SAT and ACT course preparation and so on and so forth. Teach a lot with mathematics uh, as well. Awesome. Okay. So, so you, so I guess you're familiar with a lot of Mark Stevens' work, right? Yeah, I am. I, I like a lot of what he has to say, um, especially as to thinking about how to make the state prove every element for the the venue that you're in. You know, you're in a criminal court. Yes, they do actually have to prove every element. Um, beyond a reasonable doubt, and that includes jurisdiction. Now, do, do all the things that Steven says actually work out in court? No, there's some things where he goes beyond, um, and I think maybe his bias is that he thinks about California courts too much in the common law. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, he, he is good for some things, but some stuff it's just, sorry, that's not the case. It's not going to, you know, kick it out of court. So, like, for example, what, what, kinds, of, what kinds of cases is it not uh, applicable? Um, I would say that when it, some of his perspective is about how you argue certain substantive portions of the law. I don't have the specifics to me. I have to like look it up. This is something that, you know I've looked up in the past. But if we have a specific thing, happy to talk about it. But from my the gist of what I you know wrap a lot on him um, is that 
it's the substantive law that's a little bit more unique to California. In certain states where they have a larger reliance on common law and they have very activist courts like California does, you can push a little bit more. Um, whereas if you have a state like Florida and you have a strong uh, body of laws through you know, the, you know, the statutes and the Constitution, um, you know, common law is still in the background, but it's, you know, it's not as easy to just push over uh, the court system on certain types of arguments. Um, but, you know, I think that his work as far as making the state have to prove everything, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt is definitely good. I mean, he tries to play some like legal language games with, with judges and like trying to get them to commit to positions and stuff like that. Eh, I mean, it doesn't legally work, you know, just cause a judge says something doesn't mean that that overrides what the law is. Um, that kind of thing. Yeah. You can make the judge contradict himself and feel flustered, but is that what was ruled on the substantive law part? Not necessarily, but it's good. You know, it's good stuff to think about. Have you read any of his books? Uh, like Adventures in Legal Land? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like snippets of it. Okay. You know, so. Yeah. More so, watched his videos, read his articles on his website, that that kind of stuff. Where, you know, I could sit there and skim through it and read. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you checked it out, but I, I interviewed him. And um, it was fascinating because, uh, you know, he really uh, comes at it from a different perspective. Like, you know, there's not many volunteers, sure. there are not many volunteers that actually go d go head on in the in the courts you know directly with the judges and lawyers yeah. <laughs> there are plenty of voluntarist lawyers out there i do know quite a few of them being really? in the legal field yes okay. and i know that in high positions as well positions of in government with power uh there are out there um but if you were to ask the actual lawyers you know how do things work as far as what is actually accepted in substantive law and i say substantive i'm not sure if you're familiar with that term but when I say substantive, I'm not talking about the procedures of how you process, you know, proceed with the case and process, you know, the typical things like you think about when you have to file and the, the form of the paper that you have to file. I'm talking about the law itself. What have judges said about the law? What is the history of the law? So on and so forth. Um, so, you know, when it comes to the substantive stuff, there's a lot less uh, wiggle room as far as pushing back than, pe than, you know, people would like to think. Mm -hmm. uh, at least in appellate court history. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes people can trip up the state on the procedure, that, and that's enough, and they'll get out of it based on the procedure. So, so I'm sure you heard about uh, Mark Victor. Mark Victor rings a bell, but I'm not sure. He's, not uh, sure. I, th I think he's he calls himself like the free the freedom lawyer, or something like that. He's a, he, basically a constitutionalist lawyer. He just, you know, he's pretty strict with the Constitution, which, which I guess if you're a lawyer, that's the farthest you can go. Like, like you know, somebody like like uh, Mark Stevens can't consider himself a lawyer <laughs> because he's like completely outside of the spectrum. If he's, yeah, if he's not actually licensed to practice, then he's not legally yeah. a yeah, lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just the way, the way he does it, like he would never, that would never pass for a lawyer. <laughs> but like, like I guess for for Mark uh, for Mark Victor, he, um, yeah, he sticks. I think he sticks for the most part to the Constitution, um, which uh, I guess is the is the considered the, the basics, right? Com the, the complete basic, rudimentary, uh, you know, uh, provision of rights. You know, would you say? For America, I mean, yeah, I mean, going to the Constitution, but I mean, the Constitution. Is it going to be enough alone? Obviously, you, you need all the different opinions that have been handed down. You have to analyze those things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there's a lot that's considered. I mean, how the Constitution is literally written versus the interpretations. I mean, they're just two different worlds. I mean, if you if you read um, John Hasness's article, he's a Georgetown professor. He also, I think, he graduated at Duke Law. He he writes very well uh, in a law review article about the myth of the rule of law. I mean, that's the best article example you can have of why the rule of law is actually a myth because there is no rule of single law. There's a whole bunch of different judges' interpretations. There is majority and dissenting opinion. You can't get nine people to totally agree on anything, on anything really of, of importance. It's very rare that you get, you know, a 9-0 yeah. <laughs> on, on, a, on a Supreme Court case. So the point there is, you know, there isn't really a rule of law. There's just a bunch of different decisions and different jurisdictions, and they're always competing and always fluxing and changing. And, you know, it's it's it's... It's a crazy, crazy world. I, Mark Stevens would agree with that one. So, so, so do you do you find uh, you know Mark Stevens uses the logical fallacies a lot when he's in court? I mean, uh -huh. and uh, and he, I mean, that's basically the way that he um, he kind of catches people in their contradictions. Uh, do you, sure. Do you, would you say that that's a useful useful uh, tactic to use in court? Of course, if you're not a lawyer. <laughs> it, it depends. It's one of those things where it's like a lot of times people who do those kinds of things, you know 
they end up just kicking out because like, oh, what are you here for? Oh, a seventy-five dollar ticket. Well, it's going to cost the court five hundred dollars to have all the different people, you know, in service the amount of time that you're sitting there trying to, you know, give them a hard time. So the judge would be like, all right, we don't have time for this, or I want to go see a football game, right? And so they dismiss it, but that didn't mean, oh, you have a ruling in favor of the substantive law. It just means, wow, we don't really want to deal with this person. Them having to come to court is enough of a punishment. We're done. And that happens a lot, especially with small stuff and people that want to, you know, be the people that push the issue and, and, and keep on grinding at the wheel there. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can definitely trip up the state on issues and make them, you know, hold them on every single issue that they have to prove whatever system that you're in. If you're in criminal, then beyond a reasonable doubt, civil, then you have a much lower standard with preponderance. But especially if you're in the criminal system, okay, well, you do have to make this, you can make the state and they do have to prove then each element of the crime, including up to jurisdiction, so on and so forth. Um, and they may not be prepared for that. They may have not thought to prepare for that and that can trip them up. Um, and so that happens. And yeah. then, yeah, yeah, I assume I assume yeah. most of the cases that he takes on are not like you know, like the basic the basic crimes. You know, you know, theft, murder, rape, <laughs> you know, things yeah, like that. I, the, the, most of the stuff he takes on is victimless crimes, right? Possess drug possession and moving violations, <sighs> parking violations. Yeah, and it's in California, which is its own kangaroo court. As far as, I mean, there's so much, there's so much in California that they just overrule statutes like crazy over there. I mean, that's why everybody files their civil lawsuits in California when they do class action because Cal California is so generous at moving the goalposts when it comes to, you know, policy things. So, you know, it's a tough call there, and especially if you're just in civil court where things are a bit more wily. There's a lot of little minutia rules that mm -hmm. you can get tripped up on, sure, you know. But for the average person who's going to court on a typical thing, there's probably, in your state, you're probably in a place where they have expressed rules about certain things and, you know, it could be dangerous to try to do it alone. You know, it could be it could be potentially dangerous, especially if you're in one of those crazy states. You think about the traffic light tickets, and they try to say, "Oh, you know, if you try to contest this and you lose, now we get to expand the fine up from 150 to like 300." Now, I mean, and those need to be constitutionally challenged. But again, is the person going you know, who's going up prepared to do that? Probably not. Yeah. Probably. So, so, so what would happen? Like, if I had a if I had a moving violation. You know, speeding ticket, let's say, and uh, and I were to go and try to use his tactics, and you know, ask you know what you know what what's the evidence that you have that the laws apply to me just because I'm physically in the state of New York, right? sure. You know, if I were to say that, and uh, you know, what could they do? Just like <laughs> hold me in contempt or something? What would they do? No, they would then if the state's ready to do it, they would just come back and say, okay, we have this proof. They bring up the officer. Did you? You know, what's your name, officer? Blah blah. Did you see? Well, where were you on this certain day? I was blah, blah, blah. Then, okay, did you see this person at this place on that day? Yes, right? And now you have a witness who's brought in evidence that this person was within the jurisdiction. That's what they'd have to do. But again, that comes into play. What if the cop doesn't show, right? Boom. You know, that happens sometimes where, you know, the police just don't show. And then, okay, well, guess what? There goes their case. There goes yeah. the evidence they were going to bring in. And now... Well, well, I think I think what he's what he's referring to is he, he's not even like going to the uh, he's not even making the assertion of whether the client is guilty or not guilty. He's like he's like we're not even talking about that. We're just saying right. does the law apply to my client, right? So right. so disregarding right. even if the police officer did see you speeding or not, right. like we're talking about the law itself, right? Right. Not, not whether you broke this arbitrary. Law. Right. <laughs> and, and yeah, and chances are, the so, thing is, is that the state could probably prove that in their defense. They probably, you know, I mean, they could, but are they prepared to do that? Possibly not. Because the, they're not used to, to seeing somebody actually argue all the way down that they, they legally could. Yeah. Um, is the judge feeling like doing that or feeling like getting out for lunch? Again, do you want to deal with someone who has a $75 ticket or do you want to get out for lunch in 15 minutes? Do you want to, you know, have someone in this court arguing for an hour or two or do you want to say, okay, it's costing us $500 an hour to be here. Let's get this guy out of here. Next person. They've learned their lesson. We're done. Yeah. Because I'm, you know, I'm thinking like if, you know, I haven't, I haven't gone to court in many, many years, <laughs> but if I do, good. Stay yeah, away. yeah, but, I, but, but if I do, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about like, sh should I actually attempt to use, you know, his tactics by myself? You know, is that wise? I, I mean, I don't know. That's that's something. I don't know what jurisdiction you're in, but that's something I personally. I mean, even I have tons of, of legal knowledge, having been in law school. Not that that means anything, because every lawyer is doing research every time they get something yeah. uh, handed to them. I know enough to know that I 
wouldn't be sure. I'd have to do a lot of work and research to know what I'm preparing to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I was in your position, I'd be, um, I'd definitely be spending a lot of time watching other attorneys handle similar cases. I'd go in there, I'd take notes on what the attorneys are doing, what they're saying, what's working, what's not working. I'd take that back and use that as a, as a basis for research. And a lot of attorneys do that who are learning too. They go and they watch other attorneys who are seasoned, watch what, you know, the judges or the, you know, police or the prosecutor trips up on, takes note on that and goes back and does some research. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, like when I was in, um, you know, I was in college in, let's say, 2003, I uh, I got a I got a, a a ticket like because it was like a two hour parking and and mm -hmm. they thought they thought I you know parked more but I didn't I just went to take a final and came back parked in the same place and they didn't realize it <laughs> they gave me a ticket right but I thought it was interesting I'm like all right cool I can I get to see what the justice system is like <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I, thought, I thought it was interesting you know I went there yeah. and I saw the court judges there of course I never knew about any of this stuff you know volunteerism uh -huh. or anything <clears throat> I just thought it was interesting stuff but. Um, but now I can have a completely different slant to it. So, uh, you know, because, yeah. you know, you have this idea of authority, like these people, you know, they, you know, they come in and everyone has to stand up, right? You know, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, I can't stand it. I mean, I, I, I was just, I was at jury duty the other day. And I'm glad I got out of that. I said all the right things I needed to say, apparently. <laughs> oh, so um, are, you, are you were discarded? You mean? Yeah, I, you know, and it wasn't a case where it was like a victimless crime either. So, uh -huh. you know, it wasn't like, oh, I can't wait to help nullify, you know, this law. It was like violent crimes against a specified victim uh -huh. who was a minor. Ooh. Not really the best case. I mean, yeah, he could have been innocent, but, you know, yeah. that's not really a... That's not really something to get in there and be like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to nullify this law. Oh, the you know, the anti-robbery law, the anti-you-can't-you-know-steal-children law. Oh, so it wasn't, it, there was no horses in the race for me in that one. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got, a, I got a, a summons for jury duty also in the mail, and, uh, and uh, I, I looked at it, and it said, um, you know, by law, you must provide this information. I'm like, you know what? No, I don't want to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just didn't want to. I'm like, maybe if they said please, right? I might have done it. <laughs> but I just, I don't know. That's, and then, you know, a lot of my friends online, they're like, you should have did that. You, know, you could have nullified something. I'm like, you know, I just, I just don't like that, you know, tone that the state, <laughs> that the state has. You know, they just, Everyone. they just treat you like subjects, right? Like serfs, right? <laughs> Yep. So, and the funny part is, is when you get there, you know, they try to laud you and say, "Oh, yeah, you're doing your civic duty. You're, you're such a great, you know, help to this country, and we need you." And they try to make it seem like as if, "Oh, this is your choice," or that you know, you're not going to get thrown in a cage if you yeah. decide not to come. Like they try to, they always try to psychologically manipulate people, and it drives me bonkers. That's why, like, yeah, yeah. I try to stay away from it as much as I can. <laughs> yeah, actually, that reminds me of uh, Mark Stevens was telling me he was in court. And uh, he was talking to this one witness, and he asked the witness, um, are you here of your own free will? <laughs> you know, and the witness says, of course, and I'm here because I want to be here. Mm. And he's like, I'm sorry, is this your name on the, on the subpoena? Right. <laughs> he's like, yeah. He's like, well, I'm confused. You just said that you're here of your own free will, but it says here you're forced to be here <laughs> by <So> law. <laughs> right? yeah. like, the witness just committed perjury. How can we? How can we uh, take anything uh, you know that this witness says with you know any any truth? <laughs> that's. I mean, that's very. It's it's a funny thing, but it's a hundred percent true. He is right on that. You know, you, you got a witness to perjure themselves, and not only that, you can bring in bias. Why is this witness here? Why are they forced to be here? How does it make them feel? Are they? What are they saying? And why are they saying it? Are they just saying because they just want to be out of here already because they just got subpoenaed? Those are legitimate ways you can attack a witness's credibility. Absolutely. Yeah, like that's the thing. That's the stuff that I really love about what he does is he yeah. exposes the gun in the room, the, the element of force. Right, that, that's great. That the state, you know, always uses to to do whatever. You know, <laughs> it's nothing. Yeah. Nothing about the state is uh, brilliance, you know, elegance or gentleness. Right. <laughs> sure. I mean, I, I'm fine with that too. You know, even though it might not necessarily have a outcome that he wants, the fact that he goes in there and uh, and makes people face the crap that they're sitting in. Is just a nice experience, you know, making them have to admit who pays your check. Oh, the state. The judge is paid by the state. The prosecution. Who are you paid by? The state. <laughs> so isn't there a conflict of interest, right? Yeah. Obviously, from a legal norm, they're going to say no. But to make them have to face that reality, it's it definitely, I think, stirs some thoughts in people's heads, especially if they're watching. Maybe they're in the, you know, the audience they're watching, or maybe there's other witnesses, and they're like, huh, that's a good point. You know, even though it's not going to change anything, that's a good point. 
Yeah, yeah, that's exactly why I think he does a lot of this stuff is for yeah. the people that are watching that, you know, it, it plants some seeds in some people, you know, and uh, hopefully yeah. gets them to think if, if, if you know, if, if perhaps it goes right over the, the judge and the, uh, the prosecutor. <laughs> Yeah, you know that's all. That's all we can. That's all we can hope for, right? Just to plant some seeds everywhere we go, like little Johnny, exactly. little Johnny Apple seeds, right? <laughs> Absolutely, I agree with you. So how do you? So how do you discuss um, volunteerism and anarchy with your with people that you encounter? Like, do you do you try to bring it up when, when sure. you like? How do you how do you approach it? What's your method? I usually just approach it like a very conversational way. <laughs> I had a student just ask me the day, "What's volunteerism?" Apparently, they were googling me and somehow found that. Um, so I just said. Voluntarism means maximizing consent and minimizing the initiation of violence. And he's like, "Oh, okay." He's like, "What? What does that mean?" I'm like, "Well, just maximizing consent. Like, think about it like this: If I came in your room when you weren't there and I cleaned it, and you're like, "Yeah, that's great. I cleaned your room, but you didn't ask for it." And I'm like, "Hey, you owe me fifty bucks." You'd be like, "Whoa, whoa! I, I didn't agree to that." I'm like, "Yeah, that's it." I'm like, "I don't want that. I don't want people doing stuff without my permission." And they they start to click. You know, I go with a very just simple conversational thing. No need to get political. No need to go into like left-right paradigm stuff. Just talk about how you would feel. If you talk about how you would feel if somebody did that to you, people can start to say, oh, I see what you're saying now. Okay. I, I guess I wouldn't really like that, would I? <laughs> and then, of course, if they start asking more questions and they go down the rabbit hole, but what about this? What about that? But and what about what about your family? How do they uh, approach your, your ideas? Oh, they're all pretty chill. Yeah, I have it pretty easy because my mom's libertarian, dad, my dad's like paleo-conservative, like, I don't know, he, I, I, I reach, he understands that he likes, he even supports my work, but sometimes, you know, his, uh, his, uh, he gets, he's it's caught up a little bit from religion, for religious reasons, you could say, but um, younger brother, super libertarian, younger sister is like slightly libertarian, so, even older sister's libertarian, so. And I would say I did influence all their thoughts as time progressed. I'll, I'll take credit where it's due. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, but, you know, overall, I don't have to deal too much with, like, oh, yeah, you have the super leftist parents. You have the super, you know, conservative parents kind of thing where it's, mm -hmm. you know, the political side is so ingrained. You know, mm -hmm. I can actually have real conversations with them about these things. It's nice. Wow. That's, that's uh, it's a lot nicer position than me. I, uh, I, grew yeah. in, I grew up in a fiercely Democratic family. Okay. And, uh, and my mother calls herself a socialist today, which uh, oh. I'm, which I don't really uh, I don't really tell her that in my circles that's considered an insult, you know. Does she, <laughs> does she say that with knowing like what she's asking for, like what it means? does she know what socialism means? I, I, I think uh, you, know, you know I always remember the uh, the quote that uh, the people who want socialism are the people who have not experienced it. You know, who have, <laughs> who have not lived through it, right? Like like my wife, she grew up in uh, communist Romania. Wow. And uh, and uh, and she she grew up, she she was born in eighty two and then the revolution happened in eighty nine the dictator was overthrown and mm -hmm. uh, you know there's a little you know I guess capitalism started coming in you know they started getting more channels more uh, variety of things but um, but you know being a young girl she didn't really experience that much of it like kids kids don't really experience the brunt of you know whatever kind of regime is in power it's more the adults i think kids can you know kids have fun wherever they are you know basically they they adapt right it's more i think it's more the sure. adults, the adults that suffer so it's it's her mother that really was was impacted by that you know uh grew up in and had to uh experience all the uh you know all the restrictions of uh you know private enterprise and things like that sure but uh but yeah, I, I firmly believe that it's only the people that have not experienced it that advocate something like that because, you know, I, you know. And also, if you don't know what the what the term democide means, <laughs> then of course, then then you haven't then you haven't experienced uh, communism or, or socialism, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. I mean, it, you know, yeah. I, I would say I agree with you in terms of what has been historical practice. Of course, people who hold um, socialism up. In a, you know the philosophical sense, will say it's a little bit different than his practice or yeah. communism. They'll say it's it's different, but you know it, the, what comes down is those core elements of um, of what makes a human human in terms of how they live. And for me, that's how I begin my ph philosophical journey with voluntarism: is what is the nature of being human mm -hmm. and in terms of needs and fulfilling those base needs to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's really hard to define a philosophy without starting at the actor. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think uh, they get confused. They think so socialism is just being social, right? And communism is like, <laughs> it's like sharing sure, is caring. It's like it's like community, right? We're just com we're just you know share. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of idyllic senses about that without the. You know, human incentives. Yeah, to, exactly. Uh, absent, absent human incentives. As long as you have the right dictator in power, <laughs> everything will be fine. <laughs> right? Sure. Right. Or the right education. Or the right education, or right. or the right healthcare, or the right you know whatever. <laughs> right. Um, so so um, so tell everyone you know where they can find your work. Yeah, you know, like websites, sure. Facebook page. Absolutely. Uh, main website for voluntarists is volcomic.com. That's V is in victory. O L. C O M I C. So vol v o l comic dot com. That's where the main stage is for the comic series as far as updates. Facebook, we have a, a great page there, over a thousand likes, which is awesome. Um, just recently hit that mark, so that's great. Uh, Facebook dot com slash vol comics. So it's vol comic with the s, the plural. Um, YouTube got videos there. It's where we post all of our uh, teasers and updates for video related things and promoting the campaign. So it's YouTube dot com slash the voluntarists. And now, of course, we're on Indiegogo. So if you go on Indiegogo, I mean, it's a long URL, but you just go search there, Voluntarist, or even just TSA will probably bring up the comic number one. There's not too many people who are fundraising for TSA-related things, so <laughs> it comes right on up. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's just been a, a wild ride and a lot of fun. And actually, uh, first interview where I am uh, mentioning this, I've actually just completed work um, on a 3D action uh, figure prototype a, a kind of a standing figure with the base for voluntarists and oh, yeah. Gonna, yeah i have that coming in for a prototype and i'm going to see if you know how it came out and then if it works i'm going to go ahead work from there do more of the characters and stuff like that um because i definitely want to bring this to life as much as possible you know it's, it's a culture element i want people to have the barrier broken down through it being a comic and entertainment kind of thing and assuming the uh, the premises thereafter. You know, a lot of people watch a new show because they're like, oh, this is kind of cool. There's action. They watch a comic movie. They watch, you know, wh whatever it is that's more of an entertainment related base without thinking first. Oh, what are the ethical or philosophical principles that are you know within this? Right? People just watch it because like, oh, this looks exciting. Yeah. yeah. Not because oh, I'm going to go see Watchmen because I really have deeply thought about the philosophy and ethics before <laughs> watching the movie. You know, most people are not thinking that, and that's the same way I want voluntarists to proceed is get people just to engage it because, oh, it's a comic series, or, oh, it's got, like, action or fighting sequences, and, ooh, it's interesting. <laughs> and then from there, to spring in those philosophical, ethical questions that say, okay, why are they called voluntarists? Why do they want to avoid, you know, destroying other people's property and stopping the state? You know, what's that about? So. Yeah, yeah, and, and you can definitely tell those people who don't, who don't watch, uh, you know, like, for example, Watchmen, because they understand the philosophy when they say, you know, no, nah, I didn't like Watchmen. It was just a naked blue guy, the whole movie. I, yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, my, my brother, hate, he's in love with that movie, and he just absolutely hates when people say that. <laughs> he's like, didn't you understand what the whole movie was about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're just going to hate, say so it's going to stay. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so do so, um, you want to leave with any last message for the viewers before we go? Yeah, absolutely. I would just say, you know, anybody who's watching this, I'd really appreciate it if at a minimum you just shared the campaign. Um, Facebook's metrics are killer uh, ever since they started going with, like, pay-to-play. Um, so it's been a lot harder to get the message out. Um, not because people don't love it, but just because if I post something, you know, it's reaching a, a small fraction, like 4% of what it used to. And so if you see this, feel free. Po go ahead, post the campaign link on your Facebook, your Tumblr, your YouTube, LinkedIn, whatever it is. You want to use social media just to get the message out there because it makes a big difference. And of course, if you're feeling generous, you want to contribute in any way. Every you know dollar helps to, uh, fund the campaign and push it forward. And, and as much money as I raise is how much I'll make the comic for. And we've never actually finished a full campaign, but it doesn't matter because I always have the materials in such a way that I can trim it and fit it to the amount that we fundraise. So it still is a solid you know quality outcome on the content. I'm just always ready to adjust it depending on the fundraising size. I have a, a masterpiece in mind, but there's other types of mini pieces that are ready to go. So, cool, awesome. You kind of sound like a you know a master planner. I got this idea <laughs> for the way society. No. <laughs> That's kind of how it goes. It's got a lot. Yeah, there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes that people. Some people realize if you're into business and management, you understand there's a lot of stuff that goes into the little trinkets we have or that little poster we see, whatever type of visual arts medium you see out there, you know, there's a lot of work that comes behind it. And the same thing goes for the comic series. So yeah. it, it's a hobby, but it's, it really is a full-time hobby kind of thing. 
Yeah, awesome. Looks cool. Well, you guys are doing a good job, so keep it up. People share it. That's that's gonna be uh, you know, help out help out the cause. So awesome. So um thank you for the opportunity, uh Jamie. So this is um Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Conscious Resistance Network. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take thank care. You. Take care, bye bye.